So as I said, um, this presentation is called Exploitable. It's an introduction to ethical hacking. Um, my name is Robert Underwood, and again, we have Mackenzie Benz here. Um, you can find Clemson ACM on Freenode um, and on Steam sometimes. We will have a website up here in the next day or two. I just got a DNS name, so we'll be good to go there soon. So just kind of a little broad overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about what exactly is ethical hacking. We're going to talk about how to get set up. Once you're set up, we're going to talk about how to get started. And then we're going to have a brief discussion of where to go from here. So what exactly is ethical hacking? Well, hack, at least in the frame of computers, refers to circumventing the security of software. Ethical being an adjective would say being in accordance with rules and standards. Now, most of you have probably heard or seen all of the hackers that break into, say, government databases and um, steal people's social security records or credit card numbers. This would not be an example of ethical hacking. Uh, people are clearly breaking the law and doing things that are very illegal. Uh, but that does not mean that all hacking necessarily is ethically wrong. So what are some guidelines for ethical hacking? First, do no harm. This is even harm that might be happened. Just pinging someone's machine repeatedly can potentially be harmful. If you ever heard of a DOS attack, denial of service, lots of pings going to one computer will shut down its capability to access the internet. Yeah. It's not particularly nice, but it, like on the surface, it seems pretty harmless. So you can't really target machines not belonging to you, especially not without permission. Um, so the biggest thing is first, do no harm. Even if you have permission to access other people's machines, there are ways to demonstrate that you have access and control over a system that do not require you to delete every single file that is on it. There are ways to access files and to show that something is insecure without dumping the entire database of records or publishing that entire database online. Um, the short answer is, if you think that you've heard about it on the news with reference to hacking, you probably shouldn't do it. Um, obey laws and regulations. Um, there are major consequences for doing this and doing it illegally. Um, so whenever you do this, and you're not doing it on your own stuff, make sure that you have explicit written permission from an authoritative person. Authoritative being the person in charge of those servers and owns them. So there is a caveat to that, is explicit written permission <coughs> only involves the scope of the machines you were given permission to access. Doing something else to circumvent Firewalls on machines you were given access requiring breaking into a computer that you weren't given access to is still illegal. So if there's a box here that you need to get access to, and you can do it going through this box, but you do not have permission, you can't do that. So in the case of there was an HP uh, hack several years ago, they hired a team of consultants to do a penetration test, and the consultants successfully broke into the system but they exited the scope that they were allowed to do, so they all went to prison. So when it says explicit, those are the only things you can touch. Um, yeah. If you own it, be, have fun. Yeah. So also, let us be very clear. You have a Clemson personal web space. You do not own that. You borrow that from Clemson University. So do not attack your own Clemson web space. Likewise, do not attack any other resources owned by Clemson University. This is a very quick way to get expelled. Yes, expelled. And probably also some jail time. Um, this is very illegal. In most cases, the sentences for cyber crimes are stricter than those for drug trafficking. Um, there are longer sentences, nastier sentences, and it's much harder to get parole while on these sentences. So just to be very clear, if you do not have explicit written permission to access the systems that you are going to access and perform the kinds of actions that you are going to perform, don't do it. We talked about some of these consequences. Fines. Jail. <coughs> Again, 
The point is, if you don't have permission, don't do it. So how then can you actually practice? Because if you don't practice, you're never obviously going to get very good at it. So the short answer to this is set up your own environment. So what we're demonstrating today is using um, Vagrant and VirtualBox, some ways to set up your own environments, to basically create machines that you have control over and you can use them in order to test different security aspects. <coughs> this way, you're not necessarily harming another person's machine by DDoSing it or brute forcing against it or trying any number of other things. But at the same time, you can get some experience and understanding of exactly what you're doing. So how do I get set up? So today we're demonstrating Vagrant and VirtualBox. Um, basically, you download the virtual machines and then you do some slight configuration. So installing VirtualBox, VirtualBox can be acquired from virtualbox.org. It is produced by Oracle Software. It is um, a free software program. Um, hmm? I'm log in. For okay. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so VirtualBox is a free hypervisor. Basically, it allows you to run an additional operating system on your computer besides the one <coughs> that came installed with it. Uh, you can set up these virtual machines for testing, and you can also set up more complicated network setups. These network setups could include routers, switches, multiple servers, depending on how much hardware you happen to have. Um, if you're not a big fan of Oracle for whatever reason, I highly recommend the Libvirt library. It's a virtualization library available in Linux under the GPL. Um, really useful program. It can do everything that we're going to be talking about this evening and more. So what is Vagrant? Vagrant is basically a tool for deploying virtual machines and performing the basic low-level configuration that you'd want to do. Um, it's primarily designed for software engineering environments where, you, for example, you need a development VM that you would use to in order to develop your software and make sure that everything compiles consistently, or maybe testing virtual <coughs> machines that you would use to deploy the software that you're going to be working on. Same kind of ideas, but you can also, oddly enough, use the same tools that exist within Vagrant in order to use, set up lab to have penetration environments. So you can have collections of VMs, make it very easy to blow them away and set them back up at a clean state, keep track of the state, keep track of what's going on. It's a very useful tool to learn. We're going to be talking about some basics with this today, but there's obviously a lot more that we're not going to be able to cover today. The reason we're covering this today is so if you decide to go set up your own environment to test on, it doesn't take you an hour every time you blow up the computer that you were messing with. It should only take you a few minutes every time. Yeah, and we say when you blow up, that's because at some point you will inevitably do something that completely hoses the machine and you will need to start over from scratch. So it is a thing that you will run into, something very important to know. <coughs> So how do I get started? Um, what we've done already is we've ran a vagrant up command. And what it'll do is in a few seconds, it'll tell us that the boxes are up to date, and it'll tell us that they're already running. You'll notice that the names on mine are slightly different than the names on the USB that we're passing around. Um, this is just so we don't put a ton of strain on Clemson's network this evening while we're passing around these four gigabytes worth of ISOs. Um, but now that we already have these machines up and running, let's see what that actually gives us. So we'll see that we have a Kali Linux box. We can go ahead and log in. Password is Vagrant. Um, that is the default password configured for Vagrant and for machines that are installed via Vagrant. The first thing that you're going to want to do is what's called information gathering. So we know that there are hosts on this particular network. Um, this is the Kali virtual machine at this point. So what we've done is you'll notice that on the second e Ethernet NIC, I've set up the address 192.168.44.23.24. So we're on the 44 network, the, the 192.168.44 slash 24 network. So we know that there's a vulnerable machine in that <coughs> range, but we're not entirely sure what that machine is at this point. So at this point, we'd want to do 
in perspective, information gathering is one of the most important parts of hacking. Uh, you have to know <coughs> which you're going to attack, what services are running, which ports are open, which version of the software is running. Information gathering is critical. And it's not just important to slap everything in a notepad file, it's important to have it organized. So if you're an unorganized person, you're going to want to learn how to organize the information you find from the box. So let's say you get a list of ports, you want that in a different section than services running. Yeah. So uh, this evening we're going to be demonstrating a lot of this information using the Metasploitable or the Metasploit tool framework. The Metasploit tool framework is a program developed by the Rapid7 organization. Um, they are a offensive security organization. Um, but basically what this will let us do is there are a bunch of different tools that work together. Metasploit just simply organizes these tools in a easy to use way that we can then kind of pivot and do some basic research. MSF console? No, one word. Yep. So, okay. So what you'll notice I'm doing right here is I'm telling it to run the nmap command. Metasploit has a nice little wrapper though called db underscore nmap. And what this is going to do is it's going to run the nmap and then collect the results from that and store it into the database that it keeps with all of the information. Okay, so we see that two hosts are up. So if we run the host command, it would include what hosts we had found. But what we can do now is then give it the exact host that we want to look at, which is <coughs> 20. And you'll see that it came back with a bunch of different ports and information. Um, you can also run it again with the dash capital A flag, and this will run some additional checking to get us version information. So what this is doing is it's kind of doing a detailed scan and finding out exactly what's at these different addresses. You can also run nmap separately. nmap is a very powerful tool. It gives you a lot of different information about networks. It can do everything from automated file scans for web servers. It can do port informations. It can tell you what versions of software a program is, a server is running based off what it replies to with regards to certain information. Um, so just kind of look over the Im output that we got just now. We'll see it gives us like the MAC address, it'll tell us what versions of Apache and MySQL we happen to have installed. Basically it gives us a lot of different information about the system. So this information is then stored, kind of hard to read at this size. So it tells us that what host we've scanned, it tells us the MAC address for that host, the OS name, what version of the operating system it's running, um, if it's designed for a server versus a client versus a router, it'll put that information and go ahead and auto-populate that for us. We can also run the services command at this point and it'll tell us what hosts we have found running what services and it'll tell us what versions of those services that happen to be installed. So basically, as we're doing this search, uh, Metasploit is going ahead and finding things here. Now, one thing I do want to point out is you'll notice that there's a MySQL database. Um, it's particularly a pretty old version of MySQL. So knowing that off the top of our hands, that gives us a place to kind of start our search. Um, so what we can do at this point so we can search for modules in Metasploit that will actually target MySQL. 
Okay, so we'll see at this point that there's a bunch of different ones. Um, again, this is probably a little easier to read on your computers where everything's maximized and not blown up so well. But you'll notice that there are things that are exploits. There's a couple post things, which are basically things that help you keep logged in once you're there. There's also a couple things that are listed as auxiliary. So in this case, we want to use an auxiliary for, that's a scanner for MySQL, and we want to do the login scanner. So we don't, let's say this is the first time we've ever used this particular module. The way that we can figure out what this module does is we can say show contents, or excuse me, show options will show just the particular options for this particular module. We'll notice that we'll see blank passwords as an option, um, brute force speed, um, searching database credentials in addition to the normal password lists, basically a bunch of different settings that we can go set. So what we're going to want to do at this point is we're going to want to set the R hosts value to be the address of the server that we're targeting, which is going to be 8.44.20. Okay, so now that we've done that, some other things that we're going to want to do is <coughs> the default username for a MySQL database happens to be root, so we can set the username to be root. Um, we'll also want to set up what's called a passphrase file. This is a dictionary of different um, services that it's going to be referencing over the course of trying to access this machine. So set pass file, pass underscore file. Um, Metasploit comes with some password lists in the user share Metasploit hyphen framework data <coughs> slash John word lists directory. Um, there are two ones here. We're going to use the common roots.txt. <coughs> so at this point, we're pretty much ready to do what we need to do. Um, we don't care about iterating over a entire list of um, potential usernames at this point. So we can go ahead and say set stop on success to true and then at this point we can tell metasploitable just to go so to do that exploit and it will begin to print out a lot of failed results but um, I did this earlier so I know it will in fact succeed um, while we're waiting for this to go we'll switch back over to the presentation and okay kind of continue so talking about stuff Yes. Okay. Um, so on the topic of default things, because I'd like to touch on this one, it's it makes your life real easy. Um, so a lot of people are very inexperienced when they set things up. So let's say I need to set up a website. First thing I'm going to do is how to set up a website for WordPress or Apache. I'm going to Google that. I'm going to click the first link. It's probably going to be WikiHow and it's going to take you through 14 steps of how to do it. So if you're attacking a website using WordPress, the first thing you should do is check out the default configuration that you find when you Google. And you run through those steps and you start poking at those steps. So those steps are really insecure and a lot of people use them. <coughs> In fact, a majority of people will use those steps. Um, so if that website's been set up by somebody really inexperienced, like a small business guy who doesn't have any technology backgrounds, it's probably going to be a default configuration. And having the list of steps that he followed to set that up makes your life really easy. Because you know what's where, how it's been done, and what passwords are probably there, because they probably followed the password list. 
So um, definitely always check out default configurations for services. Databases follow default configurations like he mentioned with the root password. Um, just try it, type in root, see if you get access. If you might, it, just, it might be that easy. And um, default configurations are something I always look at first. And if those don't work, then you move on to something a little heavier, like John the Ripper. Yep. So just to kind of go over what we did just now, we did some information gathering with Nmap, which gave us some information about what services happened to be running on the target machine that we were looking at. We saw that it was running a vulnerable version of um, MySQL, and we figured out that there was modules available to help us exploit that particular vulnerability. Now we're kind of moving into exploiting the VM. So some questions to ask when you're doing your initial information gathering. What ports are available on the virtual machine? Do they have a firewall configured? <coughs> if so, does it seem to be following a defu default configuration? Or does it not be? What services are running? All of these things are things that you can look at. Um, the technical term is the attack surface on the target. So basically, what exists on the target machine that we can look at for actually using to get into the machine? You guys all know what services are, correct? The general idea. All right, so just making sure. Yeah. Um, other things that you could look at, what users are on the machine? What programs do they happen to have installed? Once you have these bits of information, you can begin to kind of piece together and get access to a machine. Once you've done that, the trick, here's some suggestions for finding exploits. Things to look for are weak passwords. Um, default passwords. Default it's passwords are usually really awful, and almost every device you will ever encounter will have some sort of a default factory password. Let me rephrase that. Your passwords are probably awful. Yeah. They're all probably very weak, and John the Ripper will probably break them if you give it enough time. Yeah. So just think about that. If you think you're secure, you're probably not because your passwords are awful. Um, it's probably something sentimental to you or something you use across all of your websites. You might have typed it into somewhere in some way in some form. Maybe not in a password, but your password's probably up there. <laughs> How many of you have ever clicked like a reset my password link and then had the people email your password back to you? How many people would you say has that ever happened to? Okay, that means that the site that you have that password on Sunday. stores your password in plain text. And sends it to you over the network unencrypted. Yeah. So basically anybody who happens to be listening to traffic that day probably knows your password. Or your bank account, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, they want to ruin your career, I guess. Um, and you know your password. If they really want it, and you do anything that gets it sent or resets it, or they know it. Yeah. The moral of the story is weak passwords are everywhere, no matter how hard people try to prevent them. Passwords using the same. Yeah, using pass using the same password in multiple places. It's a bad idea, but a lot of people do it. I do it. Um, so once you start to find passwords on one machine, maybe that user used the same password for a bunch of different machines. I mean, it might not be the same format. It might have some change numbers or something, but it's the same. Thing. Yeah. As far as the computer is concerned, it's the same thing. Yeah, and you can once you know that the passwords all start with um, your dog's name, you can Bobo. Yeah, I mean it's a trivial step from there. Um, other things to look for are insecure protocols. Um, one protocol which is notably insecure is the Telnet protocol. It's a legacy remote shell. It's done unencrypted by default. Um, it's a useful thing to know exists, but it also should be like the first thing that you disable whenever you get onto a server, unless you explicitly need access to Telnet for one, whatever unearthly reason. Um, so there's two other things that I want to mention here when looking for exploits. One are CVE databases, and the other one is Metasploit. So how many of you know what a CVE or have ever heard of a CVE? Okay, A CVE is basically a number which is assigned describing a vulnerability. Um, it could be something as mild as um, a 
way that you can force a connection to close early, to something as extreme as you send a specially crafted text message to an Android phone and it surrenders root privileges to you without the user ever interacting with the device. That one's funny. Yeah. <laughs> but that's actually a real thing. That's called stage fright. Um, and it's currently unpatched on a bunch of different um, Android platforms. But basically, it's just a database of exploits, um, especially if you're working with old software. Um, a, lot of, a lot of businesses are not necessarily running the newest versions of software. There's a good chance there's some sort of record on what sort of vulnerabilities exist there. Um, other things to look for would be PHP, databases. Basically, the larger the program, the more likely it is to have vulnerabilities, especially if it was not configured properly. So let's go and see how our, hey, we happen to get a success. Looks like the password for the MySQL database is root colon, or my pass, the root password for the MySQL database just happens to be root, okay? This is probably the result of someone just kind of trying things, but in this case, it happened to work. So at this point, we can open up another tab, and then we can connect to um, 44.20. Hey we happen to have access to this MySQL database. In some cases, this is as far as you need to go to get what you want. More malicious people will go further. Let's see what we happen to have here. We have a semicolon at the end. Uh, show grants. There you go. Hey, let's see what privileges we have. He has all of them. We have all of them. Um, so grant all privileges odd period is basically you have privilege to do whatever wherever you want however you want which is bad yeah interesting little thing there well if i was a nefarious person i would know for hap for example that that i can load an arbitrary file off a disk like say etsy password all of the passwords. Hey, I now happen to know all of the users on this computer. All <coughs> of these people. And we also know which accounts are disabled and which ones aren't. So if I were a nefarious person, I might recognize that Vagrant, by default, requires a password login, and that the password for the Vagrant account should be Vagrant. Okay. So, because no, that's the default thing you set up. Default guys. Defaults. <laughs> First thing you try. So what he's doing now is he's logging in to this this particular box as the user vagrant. And since you know he wants to try the default password, which might succeed and it might not. <coughs> in the world, and he has hey. access. So let's find out what this person can do. Let's see if they have administrator privileges. Hey, they do. We have root access to the box. You now own the box. I can now do anything I freaking want on this computer. And that's just because they were running a vulnerable version of SQL, which is hosted on a ton of computers all across the world. And a lot of them are not as updated as they need to be. Yeah. So what we can notice here is even if we hadn't, for example, noticed the vagrant login, we could have, for example, picked up on MSF admin or maybe the K log or shadow. And we could have brute forced, now that we have a list of all the users that happen to exist on this machine, we could have gotten in maybe other ways. Maybe if we didn't, Vagrant happened to turn out dry, not having very many passwords or permissions. Maybe we could have used another password or another. Our friend John the Ripper. Yeah. He likes to get into computers. 
Yeah, but the moral of the story is once you have a little bit of access, it's relatively easy to escalate that into something more dangerous and more powerful. So lastly, this leads us to one very important point. Documentation, documentation, documentation. If you're doing this ethically, you're going to be documenting because you would like to close those holes you got access through. So in this case, he got access through SQL <coughs> using default passwords. So his documentation would be like, attempted to brute force the SQL database um, using John the Ripper. SQL database user root return password root login successful grant all privileges on SQL database. So the first thing you'd want to do is change the default password to SQL database. Then you're going to want to get rid of the grant all privileges. Yeah, because chances are you shouldn't have Everything. all privileges granted to any user um, if you can help it. And if you have to have an administrator like account that has basically god mode privileges, their password should not fall in the John the Riffer default password list. And by documenting all of the steps you took, you could then reverse those steps and close all of the holes, yeah. which will give you a more secure system. Yeah. So an exercise that you guys could think about for something in the future would be, one, how did I get in this time? Maybe that way will work on other machines. Also, when I find something, how can I then use that in the future to protect the machine? If you're looking for a particularly interesting and challenging security exercise, try and secure the Metasploitable d VM that you guys have set up. If you can secure that for the most part. Now, no computer is ever 100% secure unless you unplug the internet from that computer. That is the only time a computer will be unhackable. Anytime anybody claims that their computer is unhackable, they are wrong, they are lying to you. It yeah. might be difficult, and it might deter people. The more secure your system, the more people you're going to deter from breaking into your system. I now, somebody breathe it publicly. Huh? On the other hand, if you say it publicly. On the other hand, if you say it publicly, it's a challenge and somebody's going to do it. Um, but just because your system's secure doesn't mean you're unhackable. Do not think because you know how to do this, you are invulnerable on the internet. Um, you're not. There's people always more talented than you mm -hmm. that will ruin your day. Um, <laughs> this will just allow you to deter people like me, who's not very good at this, from messing with your machine. Because I'm going to get frustrated that I can't just <coughs> use group default things to break it. More dedicated people usually have an agenda and they're going to do it. Yeah. So where do I go from here? So my first recommendation is take the virtual lab that we've shown you how to set up today and we're going to work on as kind of our after presentation kind of experiment. We're going to recommend that you go ahead and find some other operating systems. Maybe you've never tried a BSD. Install OpenBSD, see if you can break into that. If you can do that one, I'd be impressed. Yeah, I would too. Um, maybe try FreeBSD or PCBSD. Maybe you try Ubuntu or Fedora. Fedora, their servers are up and coming. A lot of people have them now. Yeah. Fedora's great. CentOS, great. Um, those are going to be a lot more secure out of the box. So what we're going to be recommending at the end of the presentation is we'll show you a site where you can find some vulnerable VMs that will be better for cutting your teeth on, so to speak. Um, Metasploitable kind of, is meant to get into. Yeah. <coughs> no one should ever run Metasploitable ever as the server that they're running their stuff on. And believe it or not, we've actually seen in competitions in real world scenarios where people set up their servers on top of Metasploitable and then try to run an e-commerce server on top of it. It doesn't go well. You, you just want to cry your eyes out um, and mourn for humanity, but it does happen. Um, we're also going to recommend that you try a bunch of different applications. The only way you guys are really going to learn this stuff is by doing it. Um, try out a MySQL database. Try out an Oracle database. And Apache Dad, uh, web server. Apache web server. It's Tomcat. WordPress. WordPress is super huge. Yeah. The, there are tons of tools that are available that can help you learn about and figure out how exactly these technologies work. And once you have a better idea of how they work, you'll have a better idea of both how to defend them, but also how to get into them. Um, so a lot of these are web type applications where they have forward facing network, like a web server or a database. Uh, there's application hacking where you 
crash the application and you have it, it's called a buffer overflow attack, you use the application. You guys all know what an array is, so you have an array of, let's say, 50 characters for a password and somebody didn't secure that. You type in 51 characters, the whole thing blows up and goes down. It runs over to a memory address. <coughs> well, if you inject code into that memory address, that code will be executed, which allows you to execute arbitrary code, which then would ask you like your privileges on a computer, and then you know it locks. There are many ways to go about it. Databases, web servers, um, PHP is a good one to break into. Um, those are larger and generally less secure than an application, but you can still leverage vulnerabilities in applications. But I'm just for the sake of the argument, applications you guys all use on a daily basis may be vulnerable. So check it out, see what you can do. There's a lot of tools and power in that Kali Linux ISO. Professionals use that to do their work. <coughs> There's a reason it's out there. <coughs> so in summary, what we kind of did today is we defined ethical hacking. We started to show you guys how to set up a lab with Vagrant and VirtualBox, and hopefully after this presentation we'll have a little bit of time where we can actually do kind of a mock lab and let you guys kind of play around these things, and Mac and I will walk around and answer some questions. Um, we've covered some best practices and we've talked about where to go from here. So last steps, um, I want to recommend some further resources to you guys. There's a website called VulnHub which has a bunch of vulnerable VMs including one very similar to the one we are using today. Um, Kali Linux is the penetration testing ISO that we've sent out with the lab environment that we suggested. And lastly, I'd like to recommend um, TechSnap. They are a network and security administration podcast, and they talk about these kinds of issues. So if you have an idea of what kinds of things may be vulnerable, you may have better ideas of what to look for on your systems. Uh, There's also some other resources. Uh, if you Google InfoSec, the first link should come up. Um, and that has a lot of training, PHP exploitation, SQL database exploitation. Um, there's, what we showed you is we didn't even scratch the surface. We kind of looked at the surface from a microscope on the room. So yeah, there's, there, there's a lot to do. Uh, and that's honestly, we can't teach you all of this. It's just going to take you doing it um, to learn how to do it. <coughs> you cannot be fed this. You have to. So at this point, are there any questions before we kind of break into the lab demonstration section of this presentation? Well, yes. When I booted up Kali, it's got a username and password. Yeah. The username is root, root password, password is, is vagrant. Okay. Uh, What's the best way to verify that my uh, Kali box is connected via the like, adapter? We'll, we'll talk about that. Are there any questions about the body of our presentation before we get to the virtual machine specific stuff. Okay, seeing none, we'd like to thank you all for coming today um, and we hope you will stay for the kind of workshop portion of our presentation. You